The Independent National Electoral Commission has declared Anambra elections inconclusive and fixes the 9th of November for a supplementary poll in Iyala. Refusal of Kaduna State Government to pay compensation after demolition of properties in Zaria. And also this morning we'll be reviewing the papers here on Off the Press to share with you the major stories making headlines across Nigeria this Monday morning. We'll say then good morning and thanks for joining us on a Monday morning here on Plus TV Africa. This is The Breakfast and I am Osao Gye Ogbon. And I am Messi Bopo. It's good to have you join us this beautiful Monday morning. As always, we start with uh, some of the big stories that are trending across the country. And the first one is in Anambra State. We've been speaking about this since Saturday when the elections um, eventually uh, started, the 6th of, uh, of November. Um, it has been spoken about for so long now. And of course, eventually, uh, late uh, yesterday, INEC Den has uh, declared in elections inconclusive. It says that there were no elections in Ihiala, local government area. And the difference between the first and second, uh, which are, of course, the APGA candidate, Chukuma Soludo, and um, uh, the PDP candidate, Valentino Zibo, uh, the difference in, the, in their um, figures um, is um, you know, less than the number of registered voters for Ihiala, local government area. And so INEC has then gone ahead to declare the, the election inconclusive. There would be a supplementary election held on Tuesday, the 9th of November, uh, 2021. Mm. But you, you, you know, uh, the fact that um, this is also calling for a lot of concerns. I mean, if you look at it, our elections over time, uh, you know, we always have that inconclusive election. At some point, a lot of people had predicted that the elections will be inconclusive. We've seen that happen in Kanu, Plateau State, Imo State, and what have you. And the conspiracy terrorists will continue to be there. And some people are thinking that, you know, this is just another means of having, uh, you know, some element hijack, you know, um, the system or maybe rig the election as it is, however. And that's what the case is. Some people also say that uh, the fact that we constantly have inconclusive conclusive election is just um, a representation of the fact that uh, our electoral process and the system is entirely weak. But um, how do you even explain all of that? But it's a good thing that the election actually happened because prior to this time, we know the concerns that we had, uh, whether or not the election would hold as regards, um, <clears throat> you know, the sit-at-home order by uh, IPOP. And of course, the election held is a good thing. Uh, yeah, to some extent, looking at it, uh, one of the things that you want to say was, would probably come out as a plus is the fact that uh, contrary to the kind of expectations that we had, we felt like it was going to be a battleground where there would be a lot of shootings because of the uh, personnel that we had uh, deployed down there to ensure that it happened. But, you know, looking at everything, it felt like it went very peaceful and all of that. But also, um, like we have also talked about the issue of apathy, political apathy as one thing that we constantly talked about for the times that we mentioned, you know, we discussed the Anambra election. And that also could be seen. Although you had uh, one of the candidates, I think, uh, <clears throat> if I'm you by saying that, uh, you know, he, he doesn't think that... Uh, there was, in his word, people actually turned out. That was him giving his verdict. But however, if we're looking at 2.5 million vote, uh, registered voters, I mean, because we're going to wait at the end of the day to see the total votes that yes. were casted. And I'm not sure that we would have 2.5 million. I mean, even 2 million. I'm not even sure we're going to get close to 2. 1 million, you're looking at me with someone. <laughs> I thought you should be saying 500,000. What yeah, do you mean? Th that's what we're going to be doing. Because for the past, you know, four years, if you look at the elections, I mean, you always find that there's political... I, from the way it looks, I don't even think we we would have 300,000 from, from what it's looking you like. You think because so? Of, we, we might have 300,000. The, the, the APGA's total figures currently, PDP's total figures, and, uh, of course, the APC. Yes, there are other candidates, you know, who are scoring 800 and 200 here and there. Um, but... Yeah, it, it should. I'm thinking it might just end up somewhere around 300,000 total votes. And um, this was expected because, of course, people had mentioned, you know, that compared to the last election that there was about 400,000 um, um, votes. Um, it, it was expected that this would be maybe around that or maybe less, you know, because of the things that led to the, you know, build up to the election, you know, which you've already mentioned, you know, the security challenges, the boycott, the election by the IPOB, the sit at home orders mm -hmm. here and there and some of all of that. Um, but I would still agree with you and give kudos to the people of Anambra, you know, that kept it calm all through the electoral process. There was no report of violence anywhere, maybe because of the security operatives that were in town or maybe because the Anambra people just didn't have any interest in creating chaos. They wanted to come out and vote. 
Um, there's many other things that, you know, would be mentioned here. And, of course, I, I would not fail to mention the failure of INEC. Um, give them as much credit as possible, but I will still point out the fact that, um, you know, it is still their failure that has led to us having inconclusive elections in Anambra. So you want to agree with me that, you know, the electoral process is actually weak? Of course it is. I mean, I've said this over and over and over. We've continued. I mean, we've had 20 years to build on this electoral process. Every time there's always some new law, some new electoral, you know, act amendment, you know, that never really changes anything. They have arguments over the most basic things that really should be as simple as ABC. They, have, they, they go all the way to the National Assembly to be arguing over some very, very basic things that other countries have started doing since, you know, the 90s. And we're still at this place where, where we have inconclusive elections. And it's embarrassing that INEC had between... And, I, and this is another point that I would make. Yes, you might say that since 1999, but I'm saying all the way since 1993 even, that we've had enough time to build on an electoral process so that we can stop having this tiny, nonsense, embarrassing issues. But even going, ab abandoning 1993, between the last Anambra election and this one, there's been four years. There's <laughs> been four <laughs> years to plan. And you know with the beaver, um, <clears throat> because also that's also another the beavers, uh, highlight, yes. that the beaver's not functioning. Yes. So it brings us back to 2015 where you had the smart card readers that were introduced as, you know, part of technology to help the electoral process. And I'm saying, what have we learned? The question I keep asking, when I saw that post, you know, people complaining, a lot of persons were not able to cast their votes because of the fact that these beavers were not functioning. The big question is, did we have a test run? Which is likely not to be I, I a yes. Because, we yes, we, 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 I, because I saw some um, stakeholders saying uh, they didn't have time to do the test run. How do you introduce such a device in an election and not have a test run? Because um, you, you find out that the functionality of that also would have would have actually have to differentiate a lot of persons. Okay, look at uh, the, the the candidacy of um, uh, you know. Abga, I mean, talking about Charles Saludo right now, Chukumo Saludo, right? Uh, he waited about almost five hours to cast his vote. How many persons would be that patient? Because he is actually, I, I would give it to him. I mean, the fact that he is the one involved, his person of interest here, you would definitely have to wait to cast your vote. But my point is, how many persons will have, you know, um, the, you the, know the patience, the patience to, to, to wait for five long. hours plus to cast your vote? The big question really is what you've mentioned, and that is, how did we not have a test run? How have we had four years? And I'll continue to mention that. It's the incompetence that I, I've, I've spoken about. I spoke about, about this on Plus Politics on Friday. How we do not point out government's incompetence and, uh, you know, as reasons enough, you know, to call out government. You know, we say these things as, oh, you know, it's Nigeria and that, be used to it. But these, these things are not normal. And they should not be normal. This level of incompetence should not be normal in any way. You've had four years. Even if you introduced BVAS one year ago, two years ago, it's enough time. It's enough time in any sane society to have made sure that you, that you at least dot all the I's and cross all the T's. It, what, with whatever system, even if you want to use the native doctors in Anambra to, to carry out the election, it's enough time. You've had four years. Four years. And it's not because of lack of funding, because INEC is, is properly funded, I believe. So you've had four whole years between the last Anambra election and now, and you still don't get it right. And you still will open your mouth as, as, a, as an electoral body to say that there were no elections in Nihiala because, you know, the, the, you know, logistics issues. It's embarrassing. No, we also want to look at, because at the time I was monitoring the elections, you know, in the southern part of Nigeria uh, during the 2020, 2019 elections. And, you know, the issues are still the same. Let's talk about logistics and the conduct of these elections. At what time do you have these materials arrive? I mean, before now, we had INEC saying, oh, we're ready for the elections. We have deployed resources. We have our men on ground. And everything looks very OK. But you know, that's not the case. So we keep going in circles. We keep going in circles. It's, it's a vicious circle. Yes, and then at the end of the day, it just shows us that we're not learning any, anything from it. Because we ought to learn from you know, our previous experience and improve on it. Yeah. So we can't continue like this. Now we say that the Anambra election is going to be a reflection of what will happen in 2020. Apparently, Absolutely. this is actually what we would expect in conclusive elections. How we, how we, we do this in, in 36 <laughs> states. And if you can't do it in one state and, and you know, finish up in one day, how are you going to do it in 36 states? How many of the states across the country will be inconclusive? So we will still constantly have, the you will still have the issues of having materials not arriving, you know, when they should arrive. And the fact that, you know, some of these technologies that will be introduced will not be functioning. So all of that, and then we'll go on and then elections will not be held in some places. And then there'll be issue of, you know, someone actually snatching result sheets and what I have you. That, yeah, I heard uh, <laughs> there, was, there was a story like that. Um, not sure what 
what paper carried it. It says a supervising officer disappears with 40, 41 governorship election results sheets in Anambra. Mm. And how uh, did that happen with all of the security? You know, with all of the security that we have, uh, personnel that we have deployed, you know, so it, it, it calls for, it can be very depressing uh, to be talking about these issues because it feels like we're not even, you know, we're not getting the point and we may never get it. But however, uh, we say we're a developing nation, we're a developing democracy. We hope that we get there someday. It shouldn't, it shouldn't be enough, you know, as an excuse for incompetence, regardless. You know, and you know, I, I've spoken about incompetence. You know, from Friday when I was on Plus Politics, I was speaking about the eco e building collapse and the level of incompetence that has been shown in every single detail of you know handling that disaster, every single part of it. The fact that you know they got there and their life detecting machines were, were not working because it wasn't charged. Uh, anyway, um, also on top trend this morning, we're moving to a story where. Um, a foreigner visited the, you know, uh, the Murtala Mohammed International Airport and made a short video. I'm hoping that we can play that video uh, for you this morning, uh, where he complained bitterly about the level of corruption that exists in Nigeria's airports. Um, I think we, we can let you watch this and we'll talk about it when we come back. Two hours later, I'm checked in. I'm almost at the gate for my flight. Oh, man. You know... I've been around the world, and I've never seen an airport as insane as this one you have here in Lagos. And by that I mean, it's extremely corrupt. Picture corruption, okay? The Nigerian airport, the Lagos airport, is that very definition of corruption that would pop up in the dictionary. Literally everywhere. Literally everything here. Coming in. You don't want to wait online for your COVID test? Oh, pay this guy. You don't want to have your bags checked? Pay this guy. You want to cut the passport line? Pay this guy. You want to bring your Red Bull to security? Pay this guy. You want to get some crazy British Airways employee off your back who thinks that you were specifically filming him when you're just trying to film yourself, check it in. Hey, that guy. Oh my gosh. This is very draining and very stressful here. My friends, Nigeria is not for the faint-hearted. Go to East Africa for that. This is the next level. And, uh, of course, uh, that did go viral over the weekend. Uh, got a lot of people talking about it and sharing their own personal experiences, um, you know, go, just passing through the airports in Lagos. Um, it's, it's not the first time. You know, I've, I've seen very, you know, a lot of similar videos, um, even done by Nigerians, you know, about the level of... I think it was Fan that put out a, a short poster saying, we don't collect... <laughs> we don't collect... <laughs> Saying we don't collect bribe, the only thing we accept is thank you. Oh really? Uh, yeah, where I mean, is thank you? I mean, it's not bribe, but you can <laughs> you can just give us thank you. Well, where is thank you coming from? <laughs> Who ordered the thank you? You, you know, um, the fact that this is not the first time. Let me tell you my sentiment when I first saw the video. I felt really bad. I felt like, why would this guy talk about my country like this? No, no, really, I'm just, I'm being very honest. You know, he described me in his word. He said, you, this is the first time I'm getting to an airport. The Lagos in the airport is insane. You know, you could see corruption. He kept on saying it over and over again. And if you want to, you know, bypass your COVID test, pay this guy. If you don't want your bags to be checked, pay this guy. If you don't want this. And then I kept feeling so, no, really, I felt really, really, really angry. Yeah, uh, angry at what But then, I, I, you know, I had to come back to reality. Uh, that, that's the other part of me who've been very patriotic and feeling like why should someone talk about my country like this but on the other hand uh, what is saying is it really true or is it just blabbing the truth is it's not blabbing this is this is real these things actually happen and it's not just happening in in the aviation sector it happens across board it happens yeah. in different sectors you go to different ministries you go to i don't know how to put it almost everywhere these happened and it doesn't really tell good you, you can imagine how i felt Imagine how I, f I felt. Then, you know, someone I don't, coming I'm not to sure why you really, felt that way. No, I, mean, I really felt that way. I mean, I'm, this is me. I felt very attacked it, as a person. It, I felt it, attacked be, as a would country. It, would it have been different if it was a Nigerian saying it? No, maybe. <laughs> 
I know where you're putting me at right now, but no, I don't I know. Said, I mean, if you know that these things are true, if you know that, you know, this you know, is the, exactly the first, the, corruption the, the level truth is, is like. naturally, the first their instinct or how you feel would be, uh, I'm trying to be very, I mean, you feel like someone is trying to attack you and attack your country. Yeah. And that's some, you know, it I didn't, make me, I mean, it's, it's it didn't a, make me feel very, very good. No. But of course, I had to come back to reality. And that's why I'm saying it was some sentiment I had a few, you know, minutes before. I just told myself, well, some of the things that he has mentioned, is it really true? This, the truth is, it's true. We've had cases where, you know, issue of theft. I mean, people have lost valuables and nobody can explain, no accountability. So it is really, really shameful. And until we, you know, we're ready to have this conversation, until we're ready to put this country straight, because usually when we talk about corruption and embezzlement and fraud and what have you, we are very quick to begin to point our fingers at those who are at the top, the governors, you know, the senators yeah. and all of that. But like I constantly say, in your little, you know, area of influence and control in that space that you are, why are you doing what you're doing? And we cannot move forward as a country if you constantly, you know, begin to look the other way. It happens. I mean, there's a time where, including security, I have been in a situation on a show where you have someone call on to say, oh, don't tell me about having checkpoints and police around the area because uh, what happened? I mean, this has been a situation where uh, someone was being kidnapped, right? And this criminal element sat on the victim, the past the first checkpoint, because the police did not look away and say, well, what do you have for us? And they collected the past, the second, and the third. So you, I mean, if you have three checkpoints, how could there have been three checkpoints? So the point is, this is real. As much as we want to be very sentimental, ask myself at the time when I saw the video, mm. the truth is this things really happen. It does not just happen in the aviation sector. And I'm thinking that it's not just a call for government, but we have to be very conscious. We have to come together and say we have to put an end to this. Because the truth is, is it's not President Muhammad Buhari that is responsible for that act of corruption in there. You are responsible. And so we have to begin to put our acts together. That's the only way we can get rid of all of this, you know, bad practices. <laughs> no, you're looking at me like she's blabbing. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm just like no, I but mean, I'm pain. I'm really pain. It's, it's not. It's not in any way shocking to me because I've I've passed through all those places before. I mean, there are certain places that you pass through in Nigeria that you immediately have a frown on your face. You immediately start to frown. You immediately are upset because you do not want to have to pay anybody for anything. You pass through the airport in Nigeria, and you, I personally, immediately am angry because I don't want anyone to smile. Don't smile at me. <laughs> Don't tell me good afternoon, sir. Don't say anything. Just let me pass, pass my luggage. Let me do whatever test I need to do. Let me pay whatever I need to pay and go and sit down and wait for my flight. Don't, don't even say good morning. That's exactly how I've gotten to it. And it is because of the trauma of having very, very women, men, people that are old enough to be my father and my uncles and my aunties, asking for money for the most basic things. Um... I've just seen it again. It's by, it's by the Federal Airports Authority of Nigeria. It says we don't condone extortion at our airports. All we accept is thank you. <laughs> I'm not sure they should have put that thank you. That thank you is not necessary. It's, uh, it's the reality of, of, you know, of uh, the Nigerian system. You know? And I, I wouldn't feel in any way bad that a foreigner is calling us, calling us out. We should be ashamed of ourselves enough as a country to do better. Like you said, it's not necessarily the president's fault. Neither is it the governor's. It is Nigerians in these positions across ministries, departments, and agencies across the whole country that are, you know, letting these things happen or are the, are the ones carrying out these levels of, you know, corruption or extortion here and there. Um, but it is still a failure of systems, you know, and, and systems to checkmate these things because if you leave them, um, to, you know, to be the way that they are, then obviously people would take advantage of the failure of systems to checkmate these things. Um, if, if someone had been sacked, you know, because of this, you know, type of, 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 of incident, it would have put people in check. But of course, nobody gets fired. Nobody gets questioned. And the most embarrassing part is um, where he mentioned that he's been to airports across the world. He's been to airports in Afghanistan and North Korea and South Korea, everywhere. If you go to the airports in Ghana, the Kotoka Airport or Katoka Airport, you would never hear some of things like this. But the giant of Africa, but by himself, <laughs> big for nothing, is where you go. No, you can't you, speak of my country. Like yeah, I can <laughs> It's my country too. <laughs> it's where you go to and you get, the, get to see this. Was no, but on, on the other hand, I'm also thinking, could it be that, you know, these persons are not properly funded, they're not properly paid? I mean, they're There's not no paid. Excuse. No, I know it's not an excuse, There's but no I'm excuse. also trying to understand why. You know, all of this. It's, it's just a corrupt system. It's greed. Mm. That's, that's what it is. And the fact that nobody gets fired for it, that's what it is. 
There's, there's no excuse. If you say that, then you might as well excuse police. No, no, for, I'm not saying that. I mean, I'm, I'm just trying to, you know, go around it entirely no. to understand, you know, what is the rationale behind, you know, all of this behavior and practices. But however, like you rightly mentioned, it's like saying jungle justice, the fact that, you know, the justice system and the police cannot yeah, be trusted. Exactly. Let's go ahead and kill people. But, you know, also on the other hand, it's also important to understand, you know, why are this person's behaving the way they're behaving? Maybe hopefully we, we get to that point where we understand it. But However, like we rightly stated, it is not an excuse, it is not acceptable, and if you're in this practice, it's important that you please stop it. <laughs> we'll take a short break. When we come back, we're moving to Off the Press and looking at the major stories making headlines across Nigeria this morning. We'll have our uh, guests join us to, of course, uh, share his views on these stories. Good morning once again. Welcome to The Breakfast.